Uh, I thought a little bit yesterday about the kinds of things that I would say, and I did a little digging around on the internet, uh, and I thought a little bit about my sources of inspiration, because I've been in Viz for about 25 years now, and I am inspired by the craziest things, and when I walk around, I see visualization all around me. It's actually a part, it's a part of my life. So I thought I would walk you through some of the sources of my personal inspiration and, and leave you with a few parting thoughts. So I am, you know, we've been doing visualization. That's nothing new. So for thousands and thousands of years, people have been doing some sort of visualization. And this is just an example of a cave painting. So we use pictures to, to communicate messages and to communicate thoughts. It is a very powerful way of doing so because we're just leveraging basically the highest bandwidth channel to our brain. I am incredibly inspired by Leonardo da Vinci's work, his medical illustrations, and in fact, he has done some of the best flow visualizations that I've ever seen. In David Ebert's talk yesterday when he was talking about the Schlieren and the shadow graphs, we were really inspired by what da Vinci has done and we're still trying, in a as a visualization community, a lot of Sivis people are trying to recreate that. I am also inspired, so many of you will recognize Menard's graph for Napoleon's march to Russia. It is probably, for me personally, one of the best pieces of information visualization that I have seen because it really compactly portrays exactly what, he, what the message was, what he wanted to do. And I have it, I actually have a framed picture on my wall in my office along with kid art that my kids have done over the years and several other sources of visualization. So here, the next one might be a non-traditional source of visualization. It's really more of a computer graphics, but I really came from a computer graphics background at Texas A&M. I was there when the term scientific visualization was coined, so I was really there in the transition from doing computer graphics to visualization. And I remember Pixar when they sold machines that were you know, maybe about a third the size of this room. But I saw Toy Story for the first time as a graduate student when I was at SIGGRAPH and a short, and I was blown away. I was really blown away by the characters, by the animation, and by the computer graphics. I am also a child of Star Trek. I am on an eternal quest to recreate the holodeck. Um, you know, m many people are. I'm not foolish enough to think we will ever get there, but I, but I think we will get closer and closer, maybe asymptotically closer as time goes on. Um, so I am inspired by many, many, many things, works of art. I am inspired by movies. I am inspired by writing. So I would encourage you, and I tell all my group, to write down in a little note all of sort of the inspirational ideas that you have, whether or not you think they're groundbreaking, and write down all of the things that inspire you and pay attention to them. I am also blown away by signage, both bad and good. So we are, we see visualizations that really dictate our life and show us where to go and we don't really realize it because some of them have become so ubiquitous to us. Last Friday, I had the good fortune, along with John Stasco, who's in the audience, to participate in a NIDRD workshop for the frontiers in visualization. And the purpose of that workshop was to bring together thought leaders from a diverse set of backgrounds. We discussed sort of what we thought the future of visualization was. If you encompass scientific visualization, information visualization, and visual analytics together, we talked about why it isn't as pervasive as it should be, why it isn't ubiquitous, and why it isn't really in the hands of the people who need it. But we talked about it in terms of grand challenge problems. And I put this up there because I think that I can't think of a better grand challenge or wicked problem than education, educating our nation's children and educating our nation's public. So I was very moved by a quote that one of, it's a local artist here from UT Austin, Francesca Samsell. She actually said this sort of off the cuff. True change only happens when the soul is moved 
It is at the intersection of art and science that truly impactful change happens in those moments when the soul is truly drawn to do so. And I do believe that. I actually do believe when people are moved by something they see, that's when you're actually moving people to make a difference. I was also inspired by a quote that I saw, so I followed the Twitter feed yesterday and kind of picked one out. Lori uh, kind of sifted through these, and I really, really liked this particular quote. When you visualize data, you bring it to life and put it in story form, and this is how people want to consume it. It's certainly how I want to consume it, and I think that's true for most people. I want to leave you with probably one of the best TED Talks. I'm going to show a little clip from it. It is Hans Rosling. He is a Swedish medical doctor. For those of you who haven't seen it, John, you probably have seen this. So he's an academic, a statistician, a public speaker, and the co-founder of Gapminder, and an excellent, I'm going to show you a little clip that I think is an excellent uh, example of information visualization. I realized that there was really a need to communicate because the data of what's happening in the world and the child health of every country is very well aware. So we did this software which displays it like this. Every bubble here is a country. The, this country over here is, um, uh, this is uh, China. And this is India. The size of the bubble is the population. And on this axis here, I put fertility rate. Because my students, what they said when they looked upon the world, and I asked them, what do you really think about the world? Huh? Well, I first discovered that the textbook was Tintin mainly. Huh? <laughs> and they said the world is still we and them. And we is Western world, and them is third world. And what do you mean with Western world? I said, well, that's long life in small family. And third world is short life in large family. So this is what I could display here. I put fertility rate here, number of children per woman, one, two, three, four, up to about eight children per woman. We have very good data since 1962, 1960 about, on the size of families in all countries. The arrow margin is narrow. Here I put life expectancy at birth, from 30 years in some countries up to about 70 years. And 1962, there was really a group of countries here that was industrialized countries, and they had small families and long lives. And these were the developing countries. They had large families and they had relatively short lives. Now, what has happened since 1962? We want to see the change. Are the students right? It's still two types of countries? Or have these developing countries got smaller families and they live here? Or have they got longer lives and live up there? Let's see, we start the world. And this is all UN statistics that has been available. Here we go. Can you see there? It's China. They're moving against better health. They're improving there. All the green Latin American countries, they are moving towards smaller families. The yellow ones here are the Arabic countries, and they get larger families, but they, no, longer lives, but not larger families. The Africans are the green down here, they still remain here. This is India, Indonesia is moving on pretty fast, and in the 80s here, you have Bangladesh still among the African countries there, but now Bangladesh, it's a miracle that happens in the 80s. The imams start to promote family planning, and they move up into that corner, and in 90s, we have the terrible HIV epidemic that takes down the life expectancy of the African countries and all the rest of the world moves up into the corner where we have long lives and small family and we have a completely new world.